I am Vice President of the California Physician Assistant Board. Our PA Board President, Mr. Juan Armenta, could not be here today, and I will conduct the meeting in his absence. Today is February 7th, or Monday, February 7th, 2022, and the time is approximately 8.30. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Gompers, would you like to call the roll, please? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. I think I, I think we did a mic check earlier. Um, Charles Alexander. Present. And I believe Juan Armenta is absent. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Jennifer Carlquist. Present. Sonia Early. Present. Randy Hawkins. Did we do a mic check with Randy? This is the moderator. I do not believe Randy Hawkins is in yet. Okay. Jed Grant. Good morning. I'm here. Diego Nzunza. Present. Vasco Dion Kitt. Good morning, President. Okay, and that includes the roll. Excellent. So I believe that we have a quorum, so we will continue. And first, I'd like to say welcome back to our past president, Jed Grant. We are so fortunate to have him here and just wanted to thank him again for um, his board member service as well as uh, service to our country. So welcome back, Jed. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. It's great to be back. Excellent. So next, I would like to move to our next item on the agenda, and that is consider approval of the November 8th, 2021 board meeting minutes. I trust that all of you have had a chance to uh, read through those uh, minutes um, as I. Um, do we have any uh, member comments or corrections? Hearing none is uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, is there a public comment? Coming right up, hold on just a moment. We will be displaying instructions on the screen momentarily. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. All right, we are now displaying instructions on the screen. As I said before, if you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box and send it to all participants. Seeing no requests for comments, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to accept the minutes? This is Dion. I'll make a motion to accept. Excellent. This, is there a second? Grand, I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gompers, uh, can we call a vote? Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Vice President, this is Michael Kenocha, Legal Counsel. So it, it certainly wasn't um, improper to take public comment at the time that you did, but we will need to take um, public comment for each motion. And before that, you may want to ask again if there's any member comments. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. 
Is there uh, any member comment? Hearing none, should I call for a vote at this time? Uh, we will need to take public comment on the motion specifically. Oh, great. Okay. That's the procedure right. for each motion. All right, great. Is there a public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are now accepting public comments on uh, the meeting minutes. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. For dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the minutes as read? Uh, Vice yeah. President Early, you, you have a motion on the floor for that and it's been seconded. Okay. So at this point, at this point, you can call for the vote. Excellent. All right, great. And Ms. Gompers, can I call for a vote, please? Yes, um, and sorry, who motioned and who seconded? Uh, this is Dion, I made a motion and then Jed seconded. Thank you. Charles Alexander? Aye. Juan Armenta? Oh, sorry, I mean, um, Jennifer Carlquist? Aye. Sonia Early? Aye. Jed Grant? Aye. Diego Nzunza? Aye. Vasco Dion Kidd? Aye. That concludes the vote. Excellent. And the motion carries with unanimous vote. All right, next on the agenda is the public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, do we have any uh, anything, uh, any items to discuss? So is there a member, any member comment or questions? Okay, is there a public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are once again open for public comments for items not on the agenda. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. And let us wait just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment for items not on the agenda. Seeing no requests for public comments, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, please. Thank you. And hearing that we don't have any uh, comments on the agenda, um, I would like to move, if possible, to item number five. Um, is That's the president's report. And um, the only thing that we have is that we continue the DCA approved waivers relating to the practice of physician assistance, and we continue in the extended um, time frame um, up until April first, twenty twenty two. And during the pandemic, um, as you guys are aware, we've um, had extensions um, from March thirty first, twenty twenty. Um, until 2021, and we continue again in 2022. Um, are there any member comments or questions?
Hearing none, um, do we have a public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are opening for public comment and we will display instructions on the screen momentarily. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment at this time, would you like to close comments? Yes, please. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'd now like to move to item number six, and that is the executive officer's report by Ms. Khan. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to um, uh, let you guys know that uh, uh, Dr. Hawkins is trying to log in. Um, he's having issues, so he will join us soon. Uh, as for uh, the EO report, I'm going to start off with the office operations. Board staff is on a ro rotational telework schedule while ensuring that all operational needs are met. Staff are in the office at least three days per week while maintaining the appropriate social distancing, distancing guidelines. Curious update, the California Department of Justice has awarded the contract for prescription data collection services for the Controlled Substance Utilization Review and Evaluation System Cures to a new vendor, Bamboo Health. This change becomes effective February 9, 2022. The board has released information via its subscriber alert system ad advising licensees of the change. In addition, information is displayed on the board's website, on the board's website include the uh, Department of Justice notice released on January 18, 2022. Electronic newsletter. Board staff is currently working on developing an electronic newsletter to provide updates on regulatory matters and topics of interest. The electronic newsletter will be issued quarterly. Staff is anticipating that the, issue, the first issue of the electronic newsletter will be disseminated sometime in April, 2022. Special thanks to Jasmine Dillon for leading this effort. Lastly, information technology, board staff continues to work with DCA's Office of Public Affairs to develop an instructional video to, assess, uh, to assist applicants and licensees. This video will provide instructions on how to submit an in initial application in an effort to reduce any confusion with the application process. Once the instructional video is produced and finalized, it will be posted to the board's website and shared on the board's social media accounts. The review and redesign of the board's website to upgrade to the latest template continues to make, move forward. The new design and layout of the website will streamline the information presented and make it more user friendly. Lastly, the board continues to utilize its subscriber alert system, social media accounts and website to maximize outreach and serve as the primary communication tools to licensees and members of the public. This concludes my uh, report. I will take any questions. Excellent. I, I have a question. Um, do we know, is there a timeline for um, the information technology that you mentioned? Um, the website update or the instructional video? Um, both, actually. Um, we're actually, uh, as far as the instructional video, it, it's a work in progress. So um, you, it'll, I don't have a, a exact timeline, but I'm hoping we'll get something this year. Uh, the uh, the website, I was anticipating that that would be completed December, but, you know, um, it, you know, the, it does take time. So I kind of spoke too soon. I did see the uh, the the homepage, which is not live yet. Um, it's, it's great. Uh, uh, it's very user friendly now. But again, the pages that are linked to that, the, the tabs, they're not live and we're still working on that. So I'm hoping that should be complete, you know, this year as well. I, I just don't want to, I don't know the exact date. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Excellent report. Are there any other comments from the members? Hearing none, um, is there a public comment, Mr. Moderator? I have a comment. Excuse me. This is Charles Alexander. 
Um, I just wanted to ask about the electronic newsletter. Who, who would be the audience for that? It will be our licensees and also um, um, uh, the public as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Any other member uh, comments? Okay, public comment, Mr. Moderator. We are now open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the uh, Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And send that to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let's take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no requests for public comments, would you like to close public comments at this time? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Khan. Um, I'd like to move on to item number seven, which is board activity reports. And we will commence with Mrs. Caldwell. Ms. Caldwell. Good morning. If we could bring up the licensing population by type. Um, report. That would be the first one. Uh, it's on page 47. Bear with us just a moment and Christy sure. should have that on the screen. Perfect. So as of January 13th, 2022, our total licensing population was 22,302. And out of that 15,411 individuals are either in a current, um, a current and active or um, a family support. Any questions on that licensing population report? Chris, if we want to move to the next screen, um, agenda item seven, still 7A, but um, page 48, summary of licensing activity. And this just breaks down um, between October 1st, 2021 and December 31st, 2021. If you go back up, there we go. Um, it breaks down how many applications we received. We received initial applications for licensure 399 um, and we approved 429 of those. And then um, we obviously had other um, applications in the system. And then we renewed a total of 1,645 um, licenses. questions regarding that report? Uh, yes, I do have a quick question. Um, for the renewed licenses, are we having any problems with Breeze or any updates on how those renewed licenses are coming along? No, we don't experience. Um, typically, it's it's rare that we get a call that um, there's an issue with them making a payment. Um, mostly what we find is just um, a learning curve to um, for the user to how to use the system. And so we're here Monday through Friday to offer assistance. And then we do have um, a support team that we can transfer them to if we can't um, help them internally with the staff that we have on hand. Um, but typically, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a process that's instantaneous upon you answering the questions and making the payments, your license would renew at that moment. Excellent, thank you. So the next 
um, report is the pending application workload. And this just breaks down, gives you an idea of how many applications, um, when, how many applications we have as far as the desk age in addition to the application age. And again, the desk age is from the date that the application and payment are received. And then the application age is um, once they get assigned to a staff member. And so those um, dates can change a little bit. We do have, obviously people can apply online at any given time, any given day, um, but it does take sometimes a few days for those to get to assign to a staff member, depending upon the workload and um, just being, uh, you know, the schedule for the staff member. So right now we have um, a majority of them um, we do review <clears throat> in less than 30 days right now. We're about a three week mark for reviews. Um, so that would mean that if someone were to apply on February 7th, then they should have a review within about three weeks. So we're definitely meeting that 30 day threshold that we set for ourselves. And then most of those individuals are also receiving a license within that 30 day window. We do have some individuals that hang out a little bit longer um, for whatever reason, um, maybe they don't, um, past or initial examination, they may ha be experiencing difficulty getting some verifications or supporting documentation to us from another state agency. There may be a delay in their background check. Um, so there's a few things that can cause a little bit of a delay for our applicants, but they are reviewed um, within that first 30 days and provided with an update to let them know the status of their application. And then we work on, we work with them to provide assistance um, with uh, the deficiencies that are noted. Any questions regarding the pending application workload? Okay, so the last report is the licensing performance measures. And that will show you that our target is 30 days that we're trying to offer a review. Um, and complete an application. So the only thing that um, we do, we do if, the, if the application is reviewed and is complete, we issue the license the same day. If the application, if there's deficiencies when we complete the application review, then the um, applicant is note, um, provided a de deficiency letter. Uh, it's typically attached to an email um, and this report just lets you know that we're within that target range of 30 days. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Caldwell. Um, we're going to move to the, if there's no other questions, we'll move to item B um, uh, with compli complaints by uh, staff member Melendez. Moderator, is there a way to unmute Mr. Um, Melendez? He can't unmute himself from his computer. He has to do that himself, but I can okay. prompt him with a request. Hang on just a moment. Um, this is Rosanna. I will just go ahead and uh, present um, Armando's report. Uh, complaints received. This is this is for quarter two of October 2021 through December 2021. So complaints received was 86. Convictions arrest received was six. The total was 92. 
assigned to desk analyst is 92, pending ed intake is zero, complaints referred for investigation is eight, complaints and investigations closed was 105, complaints pending at desk analyst is 202, investigations pending at field is 73, average age of pending investigation is 210 days, investigation over eight months old is 29, the next uh, report is um, complaints received by type and source. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Too. Arm Armando is here as well. Well, Rosanna and Armando, this is Jed. I, I just have a question. Uh, it says fiscal year on here. Um, I think this uh, these numbers reflect from June until uh, now. Is that do I have that correct, or is it from October, which would be the federal fiscal yeah. year? So it's quarter two. It's from October first uh, through December uh, December thirty first. But it's a collective. If you can see uh, by the end of the the fiscal year from July 1, 2021 through December twenty twenty one. Um, for up till quarter two. So uh, it also includes quarter one as well, but we're right now reporting quarter two, which includes October, November, December. Okay, great. That, that's what I thought. So that we're essentially halfway through the fiscal year right now, which makes sense with these numbers, which uh, look like they're roughly at half the uh, total Correct. fiscal year for last year. Thank yes. you. And then one additional question. It seems like we are decreasing in all of our numbers except convictions and arrest received. Do we have, do we know of anything attributing to the increase? No, no, there, uh, sometimes um, some of them are, are, say there's cases that are like, that are open. Um, and, uh, you know, with the delay in the court systems, they're, just coming in the, the the say a conviction and um that's the only thing that i can tell you that's probably causing the delay and and receiving them excellent thank you mr melendez And um, does that complete your report or? Um... Yes, that will complete my report for now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, you. We'll move on to uh, discipline um, by staff member Hayden. Actually, uh, Sonia, before we move on, this is Jed. I just had uh, one more question on initial case review. I, I know it was covered last board meeting, but um, if Mr. Melendez, uh, is there uh, you mentioned last meeting that you're trying to set up hiring additional um, people for the initial case review, that you were trying to get PAs involved in that, something we've been working on for many years. Um, I'm wondering if there's been progress on that or if, if there's any PAs involved in the initial case review process. This time, um, we, we're still looking into that. Uh, we, have, we have to set up some meetings with our, our uh, legal counsel on how to... Um, how to uh, you know bring that on with um with the board um for now i'm, I'm still uh, picking up physicians uh, for the program but our goal is to eventually have uh pas uh, uh, if possible that that's our goal uh i i appreciate that it's been our goal for many years um and previously it was the argument was that um when the cases uh, went to, um, you know, further when there was further uh, development on the cases, we went to the attorney general's office that they wanted a physician involved at that point um, because they were deemed the expert on standard of care. I, I think there's room for argument on that. However, I, I don't think there's anybody that's more qualified to say whether or not a case has merit to proceed regarding a PA than another PA. So. Um, I, I can't stress enough how important I think it is that on these initial complaints that are reviewed to see whether or not there's merit, that there's a PA involved in that. So I, I know it's not your personal, uh, you know, uh, dif 
fault that this isn't happening, but it's something I've been bringing up for, I don't know, seven or eight years now, and it's never gotten anywhere. And so I'm just going to continue to bring it up that we really should have PAs involved in initial case review. I agree with you, Jed. I, I also agree. This is so, so important, and I echo your sentiment. And I tertiary your sentiment. I agree. Understand. Um, I, I like I said, I, I will work um, with our uh, legal counsel and um, see how we can get this accomplished as soon as possible. And we'll re, uh, we'll come back and you know inform you on on what has happened in the next board meeting. Excellent. Are there any other uh, questions or comments for Mr. Melendez? All right, hearing none, I'd like to move to item number 7C, uh, the disciplinary report with staff, men, staff member Hayden. Vice President Early. So I'll be presenting the dis discipline statistics for the second quarter, which is from October 1st, 2021 to December 21. The attorney this is the moderator. Can I interrupt for just a moment? You're coming in very quietly. Can uh, you move the microphone closer to your face or adjust the volume, please? Jesus. Um, okay, can you hear me now? It's a little bit better. Sorry, I was having problems with my headphone set. Um, so for the Office of the Attorney General, we have 11 cases initiated. 35 cases are pending. The average age of the pending cases is 203. For the formal actions filed, withdrawn, and dismissed, there was one accusation filed. For the administrative outcomes and final order, there was one application for licensure denied. There were two licensees placed on probation, one public approval, one licensee surrendered their license, and one petition for reinstatement was granted. Uh, for the citation and fine, there were three citations issued. Two citations were resolved and closed, and two citations are pending. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, this is Jed. Um, when it when you say a citation is pending, does that mean that the person that has been cited and fined is um, uh, fighting the citation, or just means they haven't paid? What does that mean when it's pending? It's pending. We are waiting for them to comply with either paying the fine or the order of abatement, which sometimes requires them to take courses. So we're waiting for that to be completed or the fine to be paid. OK, thank you. And, and is there a uh, time limit that they have to do that? 60 days or something? It's it's 60 days. Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Excellent. Do we have any other uh, questions for staff member Hayden? Thank you so much, Ms. Hayden. I'd like to move on to 7D, item 7D, probation by staff member Gerard. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, good morning, board members. Um, this is, uh, so we have 53 total probationers. Um, 44 are active uh, since last quarter. We're, we basically have the same uh, one person went from being told to active. I was able to make some site visits. Pretty excited about that. That concludes my report. Excellent. That sounds exciting. Do we have any uh, member comments or questions? Hi, this is Jed. I feel like I'm using up all my questions right now, so I'll just apologize. But I'm just curious. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to get out and do some site visits. But um, two questions. One, uh, for clarification, is the reason you weren't able to do some of those because of COVID? And two, um, when you have done some of those site visits, have you found that the compliance with the um, requirements of probation are being met the same? Or uh, have there been some problems due to COVID where 
people on probation are not complying the way they otherwise would have. Um, regarding the first question, you know, I, I don't know if it was a staffing issue because we were, we had uh, retired annuitants, but uh, as far as I know, I've become the first full-time probation employee. So I think that might've been more the reason um, for not being in the field. As far as COVID, you know, my philosophy is if you're, if you're practicing, then, you know, um, then, then you can comply. I mean, um, you know, if, if you can practice, then you can urine test. If you can, if you can practice, then you can, um, then I, I can visit. Um, so did I answer the second question, sir? Yeah, I think I I think you're getting to the point of my question, which is that uh, you know they should be compliant with all of the terms of their probation, regardless of COVID. Uh, oh. But I just uh, was wondering if on your visit or in oh, your review of the records, if you had noticed that that uh, licensees that are on probation were having increased difficulty complying. Um, okay. If that if that were an issue right now. Okay, I remember your question now, and I didn't answer it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so one of my sites visit was an intake. So that person was starting. Um, and I'm not really sure uh, to compare before. Um, I, I would say folks aren't really knowing that I'm going out yet. So I can't say there's a difference yet. Maybe I'm, I still Okay, didn't. thank you. I, I think it's fantastic that you're going out and, and verifying this stuff. I, I think that's wonderful. So thank you for your hard work on that. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Excellent. And again, um, thank you for being with us and um, another round of applause for our executive officer for having a full complement of staff members who are able to do that. Um, so we're excited to hear that you're able to go out. So thank you again. Um, does anyone have any additional um, questions or comments? For Mr. Rod. Hearing none, um, thank you so much. And we'll move on to the diversion report by Mrs. Gerard as well, Mr. Gerard. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, so we are sort of, you know, putting along in uh, the same in um, the diversion program. Uh, the numbers are here and um, I'm not sure what if I can say if, what folks are on probation or not. So um, that concludes this report, unless you have any questions. Hearing none, thank you so much, Ms. Gerard, and thank you all of the uh, reporters for the board activity reports. Those were excellent. Uh, reports to hear. Um, if we do not have any other member comment, I would like to move to public comment. Mr. Moderator. We are now taking public comments uh, for the reports given. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A section, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let's take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. Excellent. I would like to move to item number eight, Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, the director's update. Um, do we have a DCA staff member available? Good morning. This is Brianna Miller. Can everyone hear me just fine? Okay. Coming in loud and clear. Yet. Great, thank you. And as long as no one has any objections, I decided to go ahead and turn my camera on. So um, with that, I will get started. 
So good morning, board members. I'm Brianna Miller with the Department of Consumer Affairs Board and Bureau Relations. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide a department update to your board today. First, I want to say thank you and Happy New Year. DCA appreciates all board members and staff who have continued to serve through a pandemic that has affected all of us in many ways. California and the DCA have continued to adhere to health and safety mandates to protect employees, consumers, and our communities from the spread of COVID-19. Please remember that all of you as state representatives are also expected to adhere to state and local guidelines while carrying out your duties. State employees must show proof of vaccination or be subject to regular COVID-19 testing. And face coverings are still required in all indoor public settings regardless of vaccination status. DCA's testing program has expanded to additional sites, home testing for qualified employees and voluntary testing for fully vaccinated employees are also available. Moving on to an update on remote meetings. On January 5th, 2022, Governor Newsom signed an executive order that extends the sunset date in uh, Assembly 361, allowing boards and committees to meet remotely without listing board member locations through March 31st, 2022. DCA and its boards and bureaus have recognized the benefits of remote meeting options, including greater public participation, reduced costs from travel, and the ability for members and the public to participate when in-person meetings might be unsafe due to COVID-19 circulation or exposure. I'm happy to let you know too that on January 31st, Assembly Member Quirk introduced new legislation, AB 1733, which would permanently allow board and committees to meet remotely. Um, while also providing both virtual and physical options for members of the public to participate. If this bill is passed by the legislature and signed, it would take place immediately. Uh, next, an update on vaccination verification for in-person meetings. And continuing on with what I just said, we cannot be certain that AB 1733 will be enacted or when. So boards do need to prepare for the possibility of in-person meetings after March 31st. Many board, um, Pardon me. Many boards may also choose to hold one or more meetings in person to allow members to connect and to complete business, such as strategic planning, that may be more effective face to face. Before attending any in person board meeting, members must verify full vaccination with DCA's Office of Human Resources or participate in COVID 19 testing. The deadline to submit vaccination proof was uh, January 31st, but if any members have not yet done so, your participation will still assist DCA in planning for te testing at future meetings. Please do this as soon as possible and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need any assistance. I want to express my appreciation also for the flexibility of board members, staff, and the public as we have all navigated this changing pandemic together. I am optimistic about the future and I look forward to seeing you all in person one day. Uh, next, a uh, note about board appointments and recru recruitment. Uh, whether meeting remote or in person, DCA wants to help keep your board fully seated with excellent members and diverse voices. Currently, the board has two vacancies, public members appointed by the governor and the Senate Rules Committee. DCA's communications team recently released a new communications toolkit to assess boards with member recruitment, and it's available in multiple languages. Board members can also encourage individuals who are interested in appointment to visit Board Member Resources Center, which is accessed via DCA's webpage, uh, to apply for an appointment. And next, I'd like to make a note about one of your agenda items in today's meeting. I noticed in today's agenda that you will be discussing the discontinuation of the pocket card licenses. DCA believes that all boards should be looking at ways to eliminate costs, and this is one way to do so. With technology changing and bringing about changes in the way everyone does business, these efficiencies are now becoming a reality. There are several boards within DCA looking at electronic methods to verify and print licenses. For instance, the Medical Board of California is eliminating its plastic hard cards in an effort to find cost savings, as well as other boards looking to eliminate printing renewal licenses. DCA is here to help during these times and can work with your staff to ensure a, su a successful transition in an effort to save board funds. Next, I'd like to discuss and introduce DCA's new Compliance and Equity Officer. As DCA looks to the future, Director Kirkmeyer continues to lead the department toward continual improvement and excellent service. DCA is pleased to announce that Tanya Corcoran has been selected to serve as the department's first Compliance and Equity Officer uh, effective March 2nd, 2022. 
Ms. Corcoran brings invaluable expertise, insight, and years of hands-on experience with DCA's boards and bureaus to this position, most recently serving as Chief Deputy Registrar at the Contractor State uh, License Board. As a special advisor, the Compliance and Equity Officer will provide leadership and policy direction related to quality improvement uh, measures such as performance assessment, quality assurance, and incident management, risk management, regulatory compliance, and will help to improve DCA's organizational equity culture. This position will also oversee DCA solid training services, organizational improvement office, the equal employment opportunity office, and the internal audits office. Bringing these offices together under Ms. Corcoran's experienced leadership will be a tremendous benefit, allowing DCA to better identify and analyze emerging issues department-wide and provide timely solutions to DCA's divisions, boards, and bureaus. And finally, <laughs> a reminder about required board member trainings in Form 700. And that reminder is board members have training and paperwork requirements. Each year, board members are required by law to file a Form 700 before April or face penalties from the FPPC. DCA requests that you file as soon as possible. And as a tip, I'll let you know the best way to avoid uh, all my reminder phone calls and emails is to file early. If anyone needs assistance, DCA's filing officer and legal counsel are available to help. Uh, board members who were recently appointed or reappointed uh, need to attend the board member orientation training within a year of that appointment date. So that's a reminder as well. You can register for the BMOT through the Learning Management System or LMS for short, which is DCA's training portal. Live virtual trainings will be held March 9th, June 15th, and October 12th this year. This is a required training for newly appointed and reappointed members, but we also encourage it for any member who seeks a refresher. Board and Bureau Relations is happy to assist you in, with any questions you have about uh, the, use of BMO, the use of LMS and BMOM. And as always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help. So if there's anything we can do to assist your board, please don't hesitate to reach out. That concludes my presentation and I will hand it back to Vice President Early. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Do we have any uh, comments or questions from our members? I personally want to thank you for that information and your friendly reminders. I, I do appreciate those and they do help um, for us <laughs> members so to stay on target. So I, I do appreciate those. Um, do we have a public comment, Mr. Moderator? We will be taking public comments on this. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A section, which should be appearing in your lower right hand corner of your screen momentarily. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Uh, let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. This is Dr. Hawkins. Uh, may I ask a question? Absolutely, go ahead. I have a little trouble with my getting on. I'm here in the, in the flesh. So the question is about the, uh, the card uh, that uh, health practitioners historically have had to carry with them at all times. And I think that some of the reasons, some of the ways we get reports from law enforcement, for example, is that those cards are seen. Uh, what's, what will this, this new change, if it gets enacted, look like? in terms of being able to identify a physician or other middle practitioner uh, PA as being uh, a healthcare provider? Um, you know, I don't I don't want to touch, jump ahead onto the, the, the board's agenda item, which I know is coming on later. So legal, please let me know if, if I'm getting too far into what's to come. Um, but just generally speaking, what I can say from the department is that there, as I mentioned, there are boards who are exploring means um, to eliminate those those hard card license pocket licenses. Um, it, they're the license uh, the license search, uh, which is available to all consumers on DCA, has live up to date information. Um, some of our programs have explored QR codes even. Um, and and while I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm certainly not in IT. Um, our, our Office of Information Services is available to all our boards and bureaus to discuss with them options um, to get those hard cards um, 
put those aside and, and get that information um, in a new uh, electronic way. I apologize if, if that didn't answer your question, um, but, but that's that's the information I have. We're in process, it sounds like, and thanks for that response. Of course. Any other uh, member comments? Hearing none, we can move to public comment. Uh, Mr. Moderator. We are still open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Seeing no requests for public comments, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Ms. Miller. I appreciate that. All right, and I'd like to move now to item number nine, budget update um, with our DCA budget analyst. Hi, good morning. Um, so thank you for allowing us to present today. Uh, my name is Suzanne Balkis, and I am one of the budget analysts here at the Department of Consumer Affairs. <coughs> I'm here to present um, the board fund condition statement that we currently have FM5 projections included into. So to start off, we are going to be starting with the fund condition and we have an actual 2021 beginning balance of about $4.8 million with prior year adjustment of about 70,000. That gives us an adjusted beginning balance of 4.8 million and we have an overall revenue of 2.3 million and a total expenditure of about 2.3 million as well. That has a fund balance of 4.7 million, which is about 18 months in reserve. For current year, which is 2122, and this is from FM5 projections, we have our beginning balance of 4.7 million, and we have a projected total revenue of about 2.8 million. And we are tracking an overall projection uh, for FM expenditure of about 3 million. With that expenditure and revenue, we currently have a fund balance of about 4.5 million, which give you an about 16.9 months in reserve. And budget year, uh, which is the 22-23, is based on the governor's budget and the budget year 23-24 um, is based on realized. And so we have no immediate concern for this fund. Can we go to the um, next one, please? <clears throat> So the next document we have is our projected expenditure. In the projected expenditure document, you can see we are projecting about $1.1 million in personal services and about $1.7 million in OE&E expenses. We are showing a total of about $2.9 million, which create a saving of 92,000 or 3%. We have no concern for the fund and based on these projections, we look to be in good spot and I'm available with any questions yet you have. And actually just um, to add something uh, before the questions, um, last in the last board meeting, I had two questions. One of them is regarding uh, months in reserve. So the answer to that is as a board from our, from our budget perspective, we would like to see about six months in reserve. We are um, good there, but for the um, statue, it is about, about two years. So we are still in either way, we are in a really good spot here. Um, and another question regarding in-state travels, um, based on 1920, we had about $43,000 spent in um, in-state travel, but in 2021, we had less than $100 spent in in-state travel. So that was the saving um, that was questioned in regards of what we spent in 1920. So I'm available if you have any questions. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Baucus. I do have a question. So uh, thank you uh, for uh, bringing those uh, former questions uh, up to speed. Um, and so for the most part, for the bulk of the savings has been uh, related to the pandemic. Is that where we see most of the 92,000 uh, in savings with you know no travel and things like that? And the thing is, um, 
with the with projections, sometimes like you go down into, for example, in-state travel, but you will be having more spending and especially during the pandemic of like um, equipment or other items. So sometimes you have a saving in one area, but you have more spending in one area. And usually every year we have a difference in personal um, services because of the increase in salaries and a lot of other changes that happens for the personal services. But yes, this is the overall total balance, yes. Excellent, and I have one additional question. So um, it seems like the PA board has always uh, maintained uh, um, its fiscal management. Um, now uh, the projected is three times the amount of what is recommended. Is there ever uh, a cap or um, like a use it or lose it? Do we, we start losing money if we are, you know, we have so much money in reserves? So the statute states as long as it is um, less than two years. All right, so we're less right than twenty-four months years. in reserve. Yeah. Is that right? We're right at two years. Is that is that? We are below the two years. Um, I see sixteen point nine months in reserve, and so the statute is twenty-four months in reserve. But there is, if you see the, um, if we go back to the twenty-three, twenty-four, this is all based on projections so you can see that maybe um, by the end of the fiscal year there is going to be more spending so there is going to be some changes but in for now it looks like um so 22 23 will look like it's going to be at 14.5 um, percent and that's based on of course if we spent the whole expenditure and if that's the only revenue that we received but for now i don't think you exceeded the um 24 months Excellent. and it doesn't look like yeah it doesn't look for the future that are at least that two years that we're coming up that we're going to be exceeding the 24 months. Perfect. Thank you. And for that. We always work with the board if in case like we are below or we're all, we're going to be close to over and we will have a discussion always with the board of what we have to do and what the next steps are. Excellent. I appreciate that explanation. Are there any other member comments or questions? Yeah, Sonia, this is Jay. Just uh, just from prior experience, if you get over two years, then there has to be a fund reversion uh, to licensees. So you really don't want to go over that two year mark, uh, which we ran into getting close to that a few years ago. Um, so that that's the issue with the going over. And then, of course, if you go under, um, you're you have to look at you know changing fees or canceling things that you're spending money on. So. Yeah, six months to 18 months is historically where we've tried to maintain that. Excellent. Uh, sort of I think reserve. I remember that. And I think that prompted my question. So perfect. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate that. Any other board member comment or questions? <laughs> Excellent. Um, we can move to public comment, Mr. Moderator. We are now open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send your comment to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. And let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no requests for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you again, Mrs. Balk Ms. Balkis, for that report. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to um, item number 10, discussion and possible action uh, for setting the schedule for 2022 board meeting dates and locations. Um, for that, for the Physician Assistant Board 2022 proposed meeting dates, uh, we have Monday, May 9th, 2022. Um, and as we uh, anticipate uh, being removed from the virtual, um, and if we have AB 1733, 
uh, coming about that may give us the ability to have uh, in-person as well as virtual meetings. So we'll hear a little bit more about that location for the May 9th, 2022 meeting. We also have Monday, August 8th, uh, 2022 listed as well. And then also Friday, October 7th, 2022. It's a little early. Um, we try to keep our meetings under 100 days, um, but this is in 60 days uh, from that August 8th, proposed August 8th meeting. Uh, to be in conjunction with the CAPA conference uh, that is going to be held in Carlsbad, California. Um, and then also um, just to note that the Medical Board of California 2022 meeting dates are May 19th through 20th, uh, 2022, August 25th through 26th, uh, 2022, and then also December 1st through 2nd, 2022. Do we have any PA member uh, comment or questions? Hey, Sonia, it's Jed. Uh, just curious if um, we'll run into um, a, a staleness issue with the October meeting if we um, still plan on having a February meeting in 2023, if that would need to be moved to January. Um, you are probably right because the, the time frame would be a little extended. So um, I would anticipate that we would have to move up that meeting. Um, and that's something that we can discuss uh, as well. But that's a great point. Just wondering from board staff, if that's gonna cause them any issues by having an October meeting, um, having to have a January meeting instead of February uh, next year. Perhaps uh, Rosanna can comment or Rosanna can comment on that. Yes, so for the January meeting, we will be um, you know, reporting uh, data from October, November, and December. Um, I'm just trying to see if, so, I mean, we have to meet within that 100 days. Uh, just one second. So it will be January. Uh, we've had January meetings, but I always like to make sure that the you know um, we're able to run reports. Um, I don't see a problem doing that if we do have to have a January meeting. Okay, thank you. I just um, you know I think if it fits within our time frame and doesn't cause any undue burden on the board staff, it's good to have the meeting in conjunction with the uh, CAPA conference. Um, it also meets the requirement that we have a, a meeting in Southern California, which I think all of that is great. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't an unintended consequence on the follow on meeting that would would cause some difficulty by having to have it early earlier than we did this year. Yes, and then as far as the 100 days, we have to have this meeting um, no later than January 15, 2023. Right, so a meeting within the first two weeks of a new year might be problematic for some folks. Just something to consider if we have an October meeting. Also something to consider is that even though it's nice to do it in conjunction with the CAPA conference, uh, historically, there's been little to no participation from the licensed members that are at that conference. Excellent. Um, duly noted. You are correct. Um, is there any other um, member comment? Thank you, Jed. I would just add, Sonia, that um, historically uh, we have tried to do the last meeting of the year uh, early in November, uh, usually the first Monday in November. Uh, because it gives us a little more time uh, in, to get into February for the next meeting. So if we're not going to do that meeting in October, 
um, then would suggest the first Monday in November, which would be the 7th. Okay, do we have any um, other member comment? Because that does change our dates and those are um, things that we should really consider um, actually being a part of the Kappa conference, um, which is, you know, great for us to do. But again, as um, Mr. Grant mentioned that there's little to no participation. Um, and then also we would have to move up our January meeting to meet that 100 day um, guideline to right after the start of the new year. So is that something that we want to consider or should we discuss that now or keep as planned? Hey, Vice President Early, this is uh, Dion. Just a quick question. Um, has the board marketed uh, these meetings to CAPA participants? Do we have any outreach uh, to the group, uh, you know, so that we can, uh, as we're coinciding with that conference, is there any type of outreach? Um, I, if, if I remember correctly, there's always been outreach. I don't know how much. Um, uh, Maybe Jed can speak on that as well. I do remember um, one of our older conferences where we had uh, what I would consider cons considerable participation, um, but I think that was at the beginning of when uh, 697 was being introduced. And so that was um, the impetus, if I remember correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Sonia, this is Jed uh, and Dion. I would uh, second Sonia's comments. The only time we had significant participation was in conjunction with SB 697. Uh, we did work with CAPA. They put it on their agenda. We had signs out um, and they uh, that was the year that 697 was uh, going through. They did that. But in subsequent years, um, we were uh, moved to some different rooms that were a little bit further away. We did have some things in the hallway, but Kappa didn't, um, I don't recall as much uh, sort of, uh, you know, emphasis on the PA board being there, although I do believe it was in their materials, if I remember correctly, that the PA board would be meeting. But uh, the, certainly the one year they really announced it and they, uh, we, they had several people present at the meeting as well. But in subsequent years, there's been two or three subsequent years since then, uh, there was nobody from Kappa or from the licensee population at the conference that attended the meeting, at, at least that we could see in the audience. Thank you, Jed. You are correct. And then our, also our staff members, they do an excellent job in uh, recruitment and staff, you know, does all the outreach. So um, I think we're covered in, in that basis. So is that something that we want to consider? Do we want to, you know, are there any other board uh, member uh, comments, concerns with either keeping the dates or changing the dates? Okay, hearing none. Um, do we have any public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are now accepting public comments on the meeting dates. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Now let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Hey, Sonia, it's Jed again. Um, if I could just make one comment, I don't know if anyone from CAPA is on the line, but it would really be nice to have their input as to whether or not they think it's, uh, uh, you know, something they would like us to be having our meeting in conjunction with the conference. That's a great idea. Do we have any CAPA members available to speak? If they are a member of the public, they are not identified as such. But let's repeat the instructions one more time. We did have somebody just join. Um, we are open for public comment on meeting dates. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. And we have a request for comment from Teresa Chin. Hold on just one moment, and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. So 
Goodfriend. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Thank you, moderator. Um, again, my name is Teresa Chen, and I'm the executive director for the California Academy of PAs. Uh, I will give a little bit of background. I'm relatively new uh, by CAPA's institutional history standards, uh, having only been with CAPA for two years, but it's my understanding that uh, CAPA is happy to have uh, the PA boards board meeting coincide with the CAPA conference. Uh, we've already, we meaning uh, Rosanna, the executive officer at the PAB, and I have already spoken. We've allotted space for the PA board to have an exhibit. We're happy to work with the PA board on setting aside uh, any logistics and rooming and any AV needs for your needs. We're happy to welcome you if you provide uh, additional, say, outreach to the registrants and to the uh, PAs in general. We're also happy to help. As far as my knowledge on how well attended the PA board meetings were, it's hard for me to say because as I mentioned, um, this for myself will be the first in-person CAPA conference that I have attended uh, since the pandemic started. So I, you know, I would have to trust uh, PA Jen Grant on the attendance in the past, but we are happy to assist uh, whenever the PA board requests. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Chin. I'm so happy to have you at the meeting as well. I appreciate <laughs> you. your response. Excellent. Uh, are there any questions for me? Yeah, Ms. Chen, this is Jed Grant. Uh, do you feel like um, us having the the PA board meeting in conjunction with the conference is uh, uh, significant value added to Kappa members, or is it something that uh, you think is maybe less important to them? Uh, again, it's hard to say because historically, I don't know uh, the you know the attendance history of the past PA board meetings alongside CapaCon. However, I will say, just given my general sense uh, and the sentiment we feel from both members and non-members of CAPA, I don't get the sense that the PAs find attending the PA board meetings particularly important. I don't know if it's because they don't know the agenda that's being discussed, they don't know the topics, perhaps they're not that familiar with uh, the, the oversight or the relevancy of the PA board, it's unclear to me, but uh, it is my experience, my short experience with CAPA that when they attend the CAPA conferences, it is primarily for CME and for networking opportunities with other PAs. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that answer. Of course. Are there any other questions? Teresa, this is Dion. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, hearing that there are no other questions, I will go ahead and mute myself again, but I will uh, just add this. Because this is my first time uh, organizing this with Rosanna and uh, helping the PA board host these board meetings at CapaCon, it's very difficult to say what reason past PAs have not attended the PA board meetings um, more often. Uh, perhaps this is something Rosanna and I can discuss separately and find ways to perhaps use this as a pilot opportunity to try out different strategies or different outreach or promotion opportunities to encourage more engagement from PAs. So I will just end in that. Hey, Thank Teresa, uh, this is Dion again. Perhaps sure. at the end of the CAPA conference, maybe there could be a survey of participants as to the reasons why they may not necessarily attend the PA board meeting. Uh, that's a great idea. So that's something I would encourage CAPA to do. Thank you. We appreciate the suggestion. That's a great idea. Yeah, one comment might be that I think in the past, the PA board meeting was held at the same time as some of the CME sessions. Uh, and so, you know, obviously there's no CME granted for attending a PA board meeting. So. Um, I think that might have been part of the problem too. So maybe having the PA board meeting just 
the before the conference, maybe the day before the conference starts or the day, the last day of the conference uh, might be something we might uh, think about as well. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, thank you to everyone on the PA board. Moderator, I'll go ahead and mute myself. Thank you, Ms. Chen. All right, and at this moment, we do not have any additional requests for public comment. Would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. All right, um, I'd like to, is there a motion to accept the uh, dates uh, proposed, uh, the meeting dates proposed? Sonia, this is Jed. I'll, um, I'm happy to make that motion, but I, I wanted to just ask um, board staff or maybe Rosanna and speaking for the staff, um, to make sure that having um, a board meeting in the first two weeks of the new year doesn't put a, an undue burden on the staff because usually there's a, between Christmas and uh, New Year's, there's a lot of people taking time off or vacations and sometimes getting ready for a board meeting right after that time frame is, is difficult. That's a great point. Uh, Ms. Khan, would you like to comment on, on that or? Um, like I said before, um, I, I know in the past, um, our, you know, new calendar year meeting starts in, uh, you know, you guys used to have it in January. I requested to move it to February. So I had enough time to prepare for the meeting. Um, now looking at it, I, I, I feel like it would be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but I do know that, um, it's doable. I, I, I just like to you know, post all my meeting materials, the agenda, which is within 10 before, you know, within the 10 days and have the meeting materials out there during that time as well. So uh, again, if you if you do adopt this October 7th, um, it, we'll make sure that we meet that um, requirement. Excellent, thank um, you. I, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think my question really was, um, does it place an undue burden on the staff to do that? You, you guys are great. You always do whatever we ask and you bend over backwards to make it happen. We know that you'll do that, but um, I'm just uh, in making this motion, trying to figure out like, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could meet at Kappa, but it's a lot earlier in the last several years. It was held in August. Now it's in October, which puts us in a bind with the January meeting. Is it an undue burden? Meaning would it be um, create, um, you know, additional unnecessary stresses on board staff, because when we did have January meetings in the past, they were towards the end of the month, um, not uh, by the 15th, which means that um, you're really gonna be uh, busy at the beginning of the new year. So is it an undue burden or an acceptable burden? I would say right now, I, I, it would be acceptable. Um, one of the things is if, if we do move the meeting to November, I'm just looking at it, are we, do we still have an option to um, be part of the Kappa, you know, um, Kappa Con as far as um, doing outreach? Because Kappa has, they were very gracious to give us a complimentary um, booth to exhibit there. Uh, yeah, historically, they've always allowed us, uh, they, they've been really great about that, really a, a wonderful partner um, in outreach for the board. And um, I'm sure that they would still you know, they're not going to take the booth away if we're not having a meeting there. It's something you'd have to confirm with Kappa, but historically they've always uh, worked with us on booth space. Okay, with that said, um, I November would be better as far as, you know, making sure the, you know, there's not um, undue burden or stress as you stated. So um, I would, be more leaning towards November 7th. Okay, so um, I will make the motion that uh, we conduct the meetings on May 9th. Um, let's see, uh, uh, August. 
8th and November 7th. Is there a second? Uh, uh, Vice President Early, this is uh, this is Dion. I'll second that. I just want to make sure I because uh, Jed cut off there and I lost him for about 20 seconds. Is one of the uh, proposed meetings uh, going to coincide with the capital conference? Just want to make sure that's what the motion was made uh, in regarding the other dates. I'm sorry about that. I'll clarify the motion. The, the motion I'm making is not to have a meeting at the capital conference. Uh, because of the undue burden placed on board staff by having to have the follow on meeting within the first two weeks of the new year. So it would move the October 7th board meeting to November 7th was the motion that I made. Thank you for the clarification, Jed. Yeah, sure, of course. And thanks for asking the question. I'm sorry about the technology issue there. Okay, so we have a motion and then we also have a second. Uh, Ms. Gompers, can we call the vote? Uh, Vice Chair Early, if there are no more member comments, we will need to take public comment on the motion specifically. Oh, okay, great. Public comment? We are open for public comments on the motion. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box and send it to all participants. For our dial-in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. And we have a request for public comment from Teresa Chin. Hold on just one moment and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you, moderator, can you hear me? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, re <laughs> reaffirm what PA Jed Grant mentioned, whether the PA board decides to host your October meeting alongside CapaCon or whether you move your board meeting to November, Capo will indeed be happy to uh, keep a complimentary exhibit booth for the PA board at the October CapaCon meeting. Excellent. Thank you for that um, addition. You. Is there any other public comment? At the moment, there are no additional requests for public comment. Would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you so much. With that being said, um, just to uh, reiterate, um, there was a motion by Jed Grant um, to accept the meeting days of May 9th, 2022, August 8th, 2022, November 7th, 2022. However, Kappa will uh, allow the PA board to still have a booth to do outreach at that meeting. Um, and we also have a second uh, by Dr. Kidd. Um, and now, if uh, we have no other um, uh, information, I would like to call uh, a vote by Ms. Gompers. Charles Alexander. Aye. Jennifer Carlquist. Aye. Sonia Early. Aye. Jed Grant? Aye. Diego Nzunza? Aye. Vasco Dion Kidd? Aye. And that concludes the vote. And the motion carries by unanimous vote. Excellent. Thank you all for um, that vote and that information from both um, our PA board and also Kappa. Appreciate that. Um, now I'd like to move to item number 11, where that is the discussion and possible action to discontinue the printed pocket license. And now we have Ms. Caldwell. Hi. So I'm just going to um, read the information provided in the memorandum for the purpose of just the official record. Um, this is... Um, Agenda item number 11, discussion on possible action to discontinue printed pocket license. The Physician Assistant Board is proposing to make a license verification more effective for its consumers and licensees. 
um, TAB, Physician Assistant Board, would like to take the necessary steps to eliminate the issuance of pocket licenses upon initial licensure or renewal for the reasons discussed hereafter. The first um, reason is consumer protection. Initially, the primary reason for issuing a pocket license was to provide a means to verify the status of a physician assistant's license at any given time. At one point in time, this was the only way to verify the status of a license aside from calling PAB. When online verification began in 2005, the Physician Assistant Board continued to issue pocket licenses as online verification was not as widely accepted as an official record. The pocket license was considered the primary and most reliable source of license verification. However, online services have become a standard, cost-saving, environmentally friendly, and reliable method of doing business. The Department of Consumer Affairs license search is updated in real time as a license is renewed or at any time the status is changed. An easy access license search button is available on the home page of the Physician Assistant Board website. Consumers, employees, or any interested party can verify the license status online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. License status can change at any given time during a two-year licensing period. The status change from active to inactive, inactive to active, retired, and licensees can be disciplined, which would have an immediate effect on their, their license status. If the Physician Assistant Board staff updates the status of a license in the BREE system, it is reflected immediately online and the pocket license becomes invalid. For these reasons, the online verification system has become the optimal license verification source for consumer protection. The second reason is environmentally friendly. The California Board of Registered Nursing, BRN, and the Physic Physical Therapy Board of California no longer provide pocket licenses citing the following reasons. First, facilitating access to accurate license information. Second, operating with environmental awareness by eliminating paper. And third, significant cost savings in printing paper and postage. The elimination of the pocket license would abolish the board's need to purchase the printing and mailing services of pocket licenses through a third party. This would significantly reduce the use of plastic, paper, and postage required to create and deliver pocket licenses, which would lessen our impact on the environment. Third reason, cost savings. In addition to the environmental benefits of eliminating pocket cards, there are there are significant cost savings for the board as well. The cost of issuing pocket cards for fiscal year 2021-2022 was an estimated $17,467. The board would no longer need to contract with a third party company to create and mail the pocket licenses, which would result in the board saving these costs each year. Conclusion, pocket licenses may not reflect a licensee's current status as it may change within the two-year licensing period, and they do not display enforcement action taken against a license, if any. The online license verification system is a real-time and accurate depiction of a licensee's physician assistant license status. Moreover, eliminating, eliminating the printing and delivery of pocket licenses will benefit the environment as we find more ways to reduce our environmental footprint. Finally, the board will benefit by cutting costs associated with the issuance of pocket licenses. So there is an attachment um, that shows you a sample of what the current pocket card license looks like. And it does not contain a status. It does contain the expiration date. Um, this is also available as a PDF version. When a license is issued or renewed, this is a system generated um, within Breeze, and this is something that the board staff can provide to a licensee um, moving forward, which is simply attached to an email. Um, and then the second attachment is gives you an idea of what you see when you visit the um, license verification tool 
and it does offer, in addition to that basic information on the pocket card, you do get um, the um, original issuance date as well as the expiration date and the current status. And public records, public documents, anything that would be attached, um, then um, the consumers as well as employer and licensee have access to. And that concludes the presentation of the information and um, open for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Caldwell. Are there any PA uh, member comments or questions for Ms. Caldwell? Hearing none, um, is there a public comment, Mr. Moderator? Uh, Sonia, this is Jed. I was trying to get my computer to unmute there. I'm sorry about the delay. I do have a comment on the pocket license. So um, my my comment really is that um, the pocket license doesn't serve a, a, a status verification purpose. It's more of an identification purpose, right? So if I'm on an airplane and I'm asked to help somebody, the pocket license allows the flight attendant to verify that I'm a licensed PA or at the scene of an accident uh, to law enforcement to identify yourself as a medical professional. So I, I think the pocket license plays a valuable role and it's something I don't think we should get rid of. In the examples given by um, Brianna from DCA and uh, the PT board and nursing board, um, with respect to those professions, they are not likely to be, well, maybe nurses might, but. PTs are probably not likely to have to identify themselves uh, to assist uh, in an urgent time of need like that. So um, I, I think for me, um, as a licensee, uh, having had to do this, um, I it was nice to have the pocket card. Uh, if I didn't, I would have to print that PDF and then laminate it and keep it. So that's essentially a cost transference to the licensee when they're already you know, paying their license renewal fee. Uh, so um, I think it doesn't show the current status of the license, which can be done online, but it does serve an identification purpose, uh, which I think is important. I agree, Jed. Um, I've had to use my pocket license many times as well um, in various emergency situations. And um, it really pains me to think that if I didn't have that, what might have happened to you know the fellow air airline passenger? Uh, because I couldn't prove that I was a PA. Those are great um, instances, and thank you guys for both uh, sharing those. Are there any other uh, PA member comments or questions? So this is Dion. I agree with Jed and uh, Jen regarding uh, pocket license. I'll just prevent. Uh, excuse me. Just present an alternative. Um, I was on a, a flight and had to assist a passenger that was having a medical episode. Um, and at the time I didn't have my pocket uh, license on me. Um, and um, the only thing that the flight attendant asked was just my license number. And that was that sufficed uh, given the current situation and uh, the need to render emergency aid. Excellent. Um, and I remember, um, <laughs> having been a PA for a while, I remember having to print out that information um, before we got the pocket card. And so it was really nice to have a pocket card as well. I can see both um, reasons why we should and then also the cost savings. Um, so, um, but it's nice to hear that, um, you know, in those instances, the pocket card worked for those patients. And um, thank you guys again for your service. It's so important. Hello, this is uh, uh, thank Charles. you, Sonia. And oh, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead, Charles, but I have a comment after Charles. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that um, can this be done digitally instead of by paper? Can you can you make a digital copy of the uh, card? So the digital copy of the card would be a PDF. It contains the same information that could be easily emailed to all licensees upon, um, and we, we could we can do an internal process to um, 
email those to licensees as they renew. It would it would definitely increase um, the workload for staff. Um, we do have a significant amount that get returned due to um, address issues. We do our best to reach out to them by phone and email to get those pocket cards available and in their hands. But um, it is it is created when the when you renew and the initial license is issued, the PDF version is created in the system and it's easily accessible for all staff members to go ahead and, and attach an email and, and um, provide it to a licensee at any time. Thank you. Could that be done by request or is that something just done automatically? Yes, we do provide that now. So um, I would say a few years ago, when um, I started with the board, I, I wasn't involved in necessarily anything outside of the initial licensing process. But once I um, was promoted up to the staff service analyst, I was part of my responsibility was to answer the, the phone. And a majority of the questions that I received were, you know, renew, renew my license. I haven't gotten the pocket card. It's causing me issues with credentialing. And um, that's, those have greatly reduced, if not are uh, minimal at best, those, those calls that we receive anymore about, you know, I need the pocket card because um, of moving forward with the digital availability. And we just offer the PDF version and they'll say that works, that works for me, I'm good with that. You know, I can move forward with what I need to do with my employer. Um, but yes, it is available upon request. Okay, thank you. And I believe Jed. Uh, and, thanks, uh, Charles. And, yeah, thanks for your comment, Charles. That, that was going to be the, the next thing I was curious about because usually for credentialing, um, they want to see a copy of the license. So if um, if the change that you're proposing, Julie, if that happened, would that um, PDF be automatically emailed uh, at renewal or is that something they would have to call and request? Um, right now, it's offered just upon a request by email or phone. Um, I, we would have to check within the capability of Breeze to see if that could be something that's issued automatically once the license is renewed. I, I believe we have the means to trigger that, just like the uh, wall certificate is an automated um, order that goes to print services. So when somebody's initial license, the wall certificate that they receive, we do nothing special for that. That's automatically ordered. So I believe there's a means to do that within the Breeze system for a PDF version of the pocket card as well. And if I am not mistaken, a long, long time ago, we had both the certificate, the, the full page certificate, and then also the pocket card. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Well, the wall yeah, I remember that. You had to tear yeah. your tear your pocket card off of there and then uh, put it in your pocket in in your <laughs> wallet, and then you also had a certificate with it. Right. I think we're dating ourselves, but you are correct. <laughs> I believe Julie had another uh, comment. No, sorry, I didn't um, realize that you were talking about something different other than what we offer now, which is a separate wall certificate. So. Okay, is there any other member comment or questions? I would just comment that I would be more comfortable voting for this if I knew that there was going to be an automatic PDF sent to the to the licensee that has this the uh, you know basically what you showed in the board packet. If that's going to be sent automatically on renewal, then they could print that and make their own pocket card with it, then I would be comfortable with this. But if that's not going to happen automatically, if they have to call and request that, um, that creates an additional step in licensing, which, um, it, it, or in re, you know, renewing a license, which is problematic because they're going to need that for verifying their license with their employer for credentialing or for, you know, emergency situations. Um, so I, I, I would have trouble uh, voting for this right now without knowing that that for sure can be done. And I would agree. We need uh, something, if not the laminated, you know, uh, already hard card that we'd be able to show. We need something. 
Um, and in the past, we had both. So it would be nice to have um, both again. Any other PA board member comment or questions? Yeah, this is Charles. I, I, um, I mean, as a person in the public, I would definitely would want to know, you know, and have some verification of a health practitioner or provider in an emergency situation, treating myself, any person in my family or anyone that I saw in danger on an airplane or bus or whatever. Uh, I don't know how that could be verified, you know, without this process that we're talking about and uh or if there's another way that it could be done but that would be my only concern excellent any other pa member comment or question so could there be uh, this is dion could there be a pdf emailed um to Every license, uh, licensee, is that something that's uh, um, part and parcel with what we're looking at or something that can be suggested as a path forward? Yes, that's something that we will check um, in with the um, IT support to see what our options are for um, the system to issue either for it to be um, attached to their, um, so let me back up. So when an individual uses the Breeze system to renew their license, a uh, receipt is generated for their payment. So I'm hopeful that we could either have an option that you could print a PDF version of your pocket card that would show up on your dashboard, the quick start menu, or um, it's automatically emailed to the individual um, email address. The issue with the Bree system is that not all licensees have an email in the system. Some, all licensees are required to have a phone number, but not necessarily an email in the system. So that could be an issue with some individuals that are relying upon the pocket card to be emailed directly to them. And we could, um, circle back around to that once we figure out if it's um, what our options are within Breeze, what, what the system can um, offer us moving forward. But we don't have email addresses for every single licensee in the system as it is. And not all licensees are using the Breeze system to renew. So it is a PDF that's created within their Breeze account and we can access that as staff members and we can certainly email that to them or print it and mail it to them if they don't have an email. Uh, this is Dion. Just uh, and I know I'm relatively new to the board. Is there a reason why we only require them to have a phone number and not a valid email on file? Rosanna, can you speak to that? So, uh, providing an email is not um, a mandatory requirement. It's not by um, statute or by regulation. So that's something that we have. It's optional for them. Thank you. And I have a question. Um, does the Breeze system, since we do have a phone number, does it allow us to send a text message with that information or like a link uh, in the text message format? So, you're not to my knowledge. And the phone number itself could be their cell phone, home phone, or work location. And a lot of the a lot of the phone numbers in the system are work location. So, it wouldn't. It, I don't think it's necessarily um, set up to offer text messaging function. Excellent. Thanks for that information. Any other PA member comment or question? These are great questions and comments. Hi, this is Diego. I was wondering if, um, you know, in most places when you kind of do a transaction that sometimes you can input an email address for them to send you the receipt or whatever it might be. So if there's not an access or that not everyone has an email in the system, when they renew, would they be able to just input possibly an email address where they can access this and then they can just print it out at home? Yeah, that's what I'm hoping that if you use the brief system online that it would be attached to what's called a quick start menu. So any individual that registers for an account with Breeze 
the first screen that you see is called Quick Start, and that's like the home screen. It offers you the drop-down menus to change your address, to renew your license, and then on the right-hand side, it offers you, um, if you've started the renewal process but haven't paid, you'll find a cart that you can bring up the payment, and it'll also have additional resources, and one is a receipt. So you can go into the brief system at any time and print out a receipt. Um, for your records or to hand it into an employer for reimbursement. And so I'm hoping that um, after I talk to um, the developers or my Breeze liaison, um, we can see if there's some way that we could um, offer that on the home screen to print a PDF version of their pocket card information. I think that would be the best. Um, and that way, if they're not comfortable with providing an email address, then they are in control of accessing that information at any given time. And there wouldn't be an issue with uh, maybe having an incorrect email address on file. Uh, we have a lot of students that will use a school email address, and sooner or later, I believe they, they, they won't have access to those, and they may or may not realize that that is the address that they have on record with the board and it doesn't get updated. So it's probably best to have it in a central location that staff members can direct them to. That answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Excellent, and I think that's a great workaround as well. Um, any other PA board comment or questions? Uh, Sonia, do you need a motion here to direct uh, board staff to do those things, or do you want to just kind of uh, keep it informal? Uh, no, I think it would be um, a, a great uh, idea. Would you would you like to make that motion? Or is it too uh, sure? Uh, I will make the motion to direct board staff to work with Breeze and relevant uh, IT entities to verify that a electronic version of the pocket card would be automatically emailed or readily available to licensees renewing of, and to report back to the board by the next meeting. That is excellent. Thank you. And is there um, any other uh, PA uh, member comment or questions? If not, we can move to uh, public comment, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Matt, uh, Madam Vice President, you have a motion on the floor, so I think you should, you, you'll need at this point to ask if there's okay. a second for that, and then okay. and then we can move to to comments on the motion and then to public comment. Okay, great. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? This is Dion. I'll second that motion. Awesome. And then move to public comment. Mr. Moderator. If there's no more, if there's no additional board comment, uh, we are open for public comments. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. And now let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Uh, this is Rosanna. We did receive a public comment. Um, Michael, is this the right time to address that? I, I, I believe so, Rosanna. I don't think we'll be taking additional public comment on the item since we're gonna end with a motion here. Okay. Um, this comment was submitted by past president Robert Sachs. Uh, so I reviewed the agenda item 11 to discontinue the plastic pocket license. I was on the board when we fought to create this form to provide our licensees a durable form of identification as a physician assistant. The website is great, but you, you are stopped by law enforcement or attempting to gain access to a hospital. It is very important form of identification. The licensee needs to have something to pr prove they are licensed at the moment. The paper license, which had four, four, four years life expectancy, is about six weeks before it falls apart. Thus, we created the plastic license. I urge you to keep the plastic license. Thank you. Excellent. Is there any other public comment? Uh, at the moment, there is no additional request for public comment. Would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Uh, given the information uh, from the motion, um, I believe that that may um, uh, coincide with the public comment, um, but uh, I think the public comment wanted uh, the hard plastic card. Um, with that, um, I will move. We've had a motion on the floor by Mr. Grant, and then we have a second by, I think, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kidd. Is that right? And if so, I That's would like. Okay, thank you. If so, I would like to call a vote by Ms. Gompers. Charles Alexander. Aye. Jennifer Crawlquist. Aye. Sonia Early. Aye. Jed Grant. Aye. Diego Nzunza. Aye. Vasco Dion Kidd. Aye. And that concludes the vote. Excellent. The motion carries uh, by unanimous vote. Um, I believe we are due for a break. <laughs> so at this time, it is 1020. If we can uh, resume in 15 minutes at uh, 1035, um, that would be great. We will display that momentarily. Thank you. Thank uh, Ms. Caldwell for presenting uh, excellent information regarding our last um, discussion with the pocket license and also um, thanking the board members for taking a critical look at um, what is needed for that license. Um, so thank you again for that. Uh, Mr. Knotes, do I need to call roll um, or shall I just proceed? Uh, Vice President Early, yes, we, we should call roll to make sure we have quorum. Excellent. All right. So um, I'd like to begin the meeting again at 1036. And then also, Ms. Gompers, I'd like to call roll. Hi, this is Rosanna. I'll call roll. Sonia Early. I here present. Charles Alexander. Aye. Jennifer Carlquist. Aye. Jed Grant. Jed Grant. Well, I have a little trouble with the mute button. I'm present. Thank you. Randy Hawkins. Randy Hawkins. Here. Diego Nzunza. Present. Vasco Dion Kidd. I'm present. Excellent. I think everyone is present. Perfect. Um, now I'd like to move to item number 12, uh, the report on Medical Board of California activities by Dr. Hawkins. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, can't see the my camera button, but something was going on with this computer. Again, thanks again for the opportunity. Um, and also, again, I'd like to reiterate thanks for that robust discussion on the prior topic um so the quarterly board meeting and the committee meetings of the medical board of california will, will be virtual this month one panel panel a will meet wednesday the 9th quarterly board meetings will be thursday the 10th and friday the 11th the agenda can be reviewed at our website mbc.ca.gov i want to draw particular attention to two educational presentations and encourage all interested staff 
board members and physician assistants to view. The first is on Thursday the 10th at about 2 p.m. The topic is presentation on chronic intractable pain treatment um, by a Dr. Mackey, an expert in this area. So presentation on chronic intractable pain treatment. The second is on Friday the 11th at 9 a.m. approximately, presentation on integrating cultural and linguistic competency and continuing medical education. Uh, with the two important topics. Uh, next, I want to draw attention to the medical board's 2022 legislative request. Several very important items are limiting the medical board and its mission of public protection. We recently shared the board's 2022 legislative request with members of the California State Legislature. We highlighted two proposals related to resources and enforcement important to our mission. I'm gonna mention those two highlighted proposals. The first was underfunding and the need to have the necessary physician license fee increase. The medical board was awarded, was awarded a minimal fee increase instead of the amount requested and required. Prior to this, the last license fee increase was 15 years ago, grossly underfunded. The second highlighted proposal is burden of proof required to discipline. The medical board of California's burden of proof required to investigate and discipline physicians needs to be changed to be in line with the vast majority of other medical boards in the United States. Uh, the other boards, 41 out of 50, require a standard of preponderance of the evidence rather than our higher burden of clear and convincing proof to reasonable certainty. The recommended changes would ensure the board can more efficiently fulfill its mission to protect California healthcare consumers and promote access to quality of medical care. There were several other board proposals uh, that were approved at our most recent November 17th, 18th quarterly uh, board meeting. And these are included in our sunset and also in the report that we sent to the, uh, the 2022 legislative request. And finally, there are other issues you may have been, you may have viewed in the media. Well, one is the inaccurate representation that the board protects physicians and not the public. There's been a lot of press and in several interviews uh, by board leadership, um, LA Times, uh, National TV. And the second was, uh, was the confrontation of the president of the medical board by an out of state entity with audio and video at her home and her business. This ends my report. Thank you. Are there any uh, member comments or questions for Dr. Hawkins? All right, is there any public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are now open for public comment and will be displaying instructions on the screen momentarily. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A section uh, located in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let us take just a second longer. Seeing no requests for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for providing the PA board with um, excellent information about um, the happenings of the uh, Medical Board of California. Thank you again. Thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to move to item number 13, uh, regulations, update, and possible action on pending regulatory packages by uh, Karen Halbo and Ms. Dillon. Good morning. This is Jasmine. All right. So going over the first package, which is labeled required actions against registered sex offenders, this revised um, proposed regulatory language was approved and adopted by the board at its November 8th, 2021 meeting. Um, agency approved this package on December 17th, 2021, and it was filed with the Office of Administrative Law on December 20th, 2021. And I am currently working with the Office of Administrative Law and the Department of Finance to 
ensure that this package um, is finalized and approved um, as soon as possible. We should get that package um, approved in the coming months. And moving on to the license renewal and continuing medical education required package. The revised proposed regulatory language was approved and adopted by the board at its November 8th, 2021 meeting. And staff will be working on the initial documents to submit for initial review this year. The next package, implicit bias training in approved continuing medical education programs. Um, final documents were sent to legal and agency for review. And once approved, the package was filed with the Office of Administrative Law on December 13th, 2021. And the Office of Administrative Law approved this package on January 25th, 2022, with an effective date of April 1st, 2022. And this package, um, the documents for this package have been posted on our website as well. The next package, um, SB 697 Implementation. The proposed regulatory language passed by the board and approved by the Medical Board of California has been revised to address concerns raised by the California Academy of Physician Assistants and DCA's Legal Affairs Division. The revised proposed re regulatory language was approved and adopted by the board at its November 8th, 2021 meeting. And staff is currently working on initial documents with Regulations Council to submit for initial review. The next package, SB 697, Applications, Exam Scores, Addresses, and Record Keeping. The proposed regulatory language passed by the board has been revised to address further concerns raised by the California Academy of Physician Assistants and DCA's Legal Affairs Division. The revised proposed regulatory language was approved and adopted by the board at its November 8th, 2021 meeting. And staff is currently working on the initial documents with Regulations Council to submit for initial review. And moving on to the last two packages, uh, the first one being retired status to include fingerprint requirement. Um, staff will be working on these documents, um, but after we have completed the um, prior uh, regulation packages that I've discussed above. Um, this package is um, not as high of a priority as the other packages, but uh, we will ensure that this package will, um, will begin um, initial documents for this package as well. And then for the SB 1441, implement uniform standards related to substance abusing licensees and update of disciplinary guidelines. Um, same with this package. Um, it is uh, definitely on our radar and we will be um, beginning the documents and proposed texts for this package. Um, but we do have other packages that are a higher priority right now and we would like to get the other ones uh, moving before we begin on this one. So, and that is all for the regulatory um, update. Um, if there's any questions or concerns, uh, please go ahead. Sonia, this is Jed. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, Jasmine, I um, I might be missing I, I'm, I might be missing something, but on the one regulatory package that talks about not having to set the date and time or type of exam, um, I thought that when the governor signed uh, our bill, sort of renewing the board this last year, that that was addressed in that. Am I thinking of two different things? Or was that covered uh, under our, our reauthorization? Um, I believe what you're discussing is the um, technical um, code section amendments that were made um, through SB 806. Um, yes, those were those were um, changes made to um, certain um, statutes, but um, and that is um, that's different than um, the package that uh, I was discussing earlier. Um, those changes have been made and those were um, updated. So if you look up that code section where um, I can't, it's, I can't get it off the top of my head, but um, if you look up that code section that discusses um, the board's, uh, the board um, implementing the time and date for the exam, you'll see that um, it has been amended to reflect the changes that were passed with SB 806. Excellent. Is there any other? Okay, so in this, 
Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Sonia, I just want to clarify in uh, the, I can't scroll on this page here, but in the item agenda where you talk about one of the things that's being changed for the exam, date and time of the exam, is that, um, yeah, item, what is that, five? Um, is that, those are different, are those for regulations or is that, uh, how is this different than what was done under 806? I guess is what I'm asking. So the item number five, um, the SB 697 applications, exam scores, addresses, and record keeping are regulatory changes to our um, our regulations um, that the board um, implements. And those are in accordance with the changes that were addressed in SB 697. Um, so we are now um, proposing amendments to our regulations, whereas the changes I believe that you're um, that you're mentioning are the changes to a code section, the business and professions code section, which were technical changes um, that were uh, made with the passage of SB 806. Does that answer your question? Okay, but the regulations cover the same topic material, right? So SB 697 changes, but so did 806. I, I think that's what I'm, why I'm getting confused. Well, the regulations. Part, part of it is the same, the same regulations. Some of the regulations would have changed under 806, will also change under SB 697, specifically the date, time, location for exams, that kind of stuff that we have to redo every year. Well, the code section that was changed with SB 806 basically it initially authorized our board to set the time and date for the examination, whereas now that is with um, the NCCPA. And so that authorizes the NCCPA to set the time and date, whereas these regulations that we are currently working on amending with the SB 697 changes, those are regulations that um, further... I guess, explain, you know, the processes and, you know, the requirements um, for regarding application exam scores and addresses and record keeping. But the code section that authorizes the NCCPA to, uh, to issue the time and date for the exam has already been amended through SB 806. And um, so... I'm not sure if that answers your question, but okay. I think I think I understand. Yeah. Yeah, it did. I th yeah, thank you. So I, I think I understand essentially 806 amended the code and these are regulations uh, yes. that we're doing to does that sound right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Excellent. Is there any other uh, member comment or questions? And I have one if we, if no one else does. Um, on item number three, where it talks about implicit bias training and approved continuing medical education programs, my question is, it talks about an approved curriculum. And if so, what is that curriculum or have we received that? And then also, it also mentions that um, to comply with those provisions for that CME um, or for those providers and that the board will begin auditing um, those CME providers. And so are they auditing, uh, is the board auditing the providers, the curriculum, and then making sure of that? And do we have the manpower um, to do so? Um, let's see. You know, I'd have to go back to look at that package because um, it looks like that the board approved the language back in 2020 um but yeah i can i can get back to you on that sonia if i can shoot you an email okay that's okay. okay great yes yeah, so regarding that curriculum and then also um maybe for uh, miss khan um do you anticipate um having enough um manpower to um audit um those providers with that new um addendum to to include implicit bias training to the CMEs? Yes, we do. We have uh, we do have two full time uh, licensing staff. Uh, I believe this will be conducted through our uh, licensing um, unit. Awesome. Excellent. Um, any other uh, PA member comment or questions? 
Uh, this is Dion Kidd. Uh, this is kind of deja vu. I'm actually submitting a paper on implicit bias in two weeks. Uh, just a quick question. I would, um, is this, uh, is the implicit bias curriculum, or I'm not sure if anyone has an answer to this, but is this kind of a one-off session or is there, uh, you know, at my institution, there's uh, six modules that we have to go through and complete uh, uh, to have our implicit bias signed off. Uh, it's it's uh, optional at the moment, um, but just as we dig deeper into the curriculum to really know what the requirement is uh, for the state. So that way um, we understand what compliance means. Hi, this is Jed. Thanks for your comment, Dion. You know, one thing that I think might be helpful um, in this, we used to have the text of the language included in the board packet. Uh, while these summaries are excellent and very helpful for sort of seeing what's going on, sometimes it's hard to remember exactly what the language was that we approved. And since it's not yet published as a part of the law in our book, um, it, for me anyway, it would be helpful to have the, the language that we approved in there so that we could refresh our memory and um, understand what we did when we're, we're tracking this. I do recall this, which uh, briefly, if, if my recollection is correct, uh, we talked about when that uh, that Im implicit bias training is required and when it's delivered. Um, there are pretty minimum requirements uh, for what it had to include, uh, but I don't recall the detail on it. So maybe in the future we could have um, just the language of the language that we had approved for these regulations that are moving through uh, as included as part of the board packet so that we can recall what's happening with them. Excellent idea, I agree. Um, any other uh, PA member comment or questions? Um, Sonia, this is Karen Halbo, the Regulations yes. Council. I have yes. my hand raised, I don't know if you can see that. Thank you, yes. Um, the the change to the regulatory section on implicit bias simply added that starting January 1 of this year, any CME course that has a direct patient care component has to have curriculum for, a, you know, for an understanding of implicit bias. And we just put pursuant to section 20, 3524.5 of the code. So I was looking up the code section to be able to read that to you so that you, you see the, the regulation doesn't give specifics about that. It basically cites to the law and says you have to have what the law says is the implicit bias education. Um, so if we were gonna, I, frankly, I agree, it's good to have the regulation language, but in this case, the change specifically says do what it says in the law, so you should have the regulation language plus the law that's that's being cited. Um, let's see, uh, twenty-four point five. Uh, it's just okay. They have under under the BPC twenty thirty five twenty four point five D. They're saying to be a sufficient continuing edu course, education course, it has to address one or a combination of examples of how implicit bias affects perceptions and treatment decisions of physician assistants leading to disparities in health outcomes, health outcomes, or number two, strategies to address how unintended biases in decision making may contribute to healthcare disparities by shaping behavior and producing differences in medical treatment along the lines of race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, socioeconomic status, or other characteristics. So since the law had a pretty good description of what the legislature is looking to have these courses do, that's why the change to the regulation is simply, hey, follow the law starting January this year, you gotta have CE of this involved if you're giving a course with a direct patient care component. So that I just, I realized I can answer this question. So I <laughs> thank, to. You. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that because I could not remember um, what the curriculum was, the curriculum points were. So thank you so much for that. That, that clarifies those things. And I hope that helps um, also with Jed's question as well. I just have a, a follow-up question, uh, uh, Sonia. Um, Karen, so it, it says that it's a CME course. What about those implicit bias training courses that are not CME? Right, there are institutional 
um, offerings of implicit bias um, at many hospitals and in other areas, and they invite guest speakers and other folks to come in and talk about implicit bias. Would that not suffice, or would it have to be specifically a CME regulated course and subsequently be certificated? Well, it, it, it that as it is, the regulation is talking about CME course. Um, and given how deep the issue is in our society, they're going to need to all of us learn it over and over in different ways with different speakers and different things. So I, I appreciate you saying having these presentations at hospitals and things are very valuable and a good learning tool. But the language of, of this regulation simply says that any course that has this direct patient care has to have at least this education. And it's this has been, I believe this is approved. So, you know, if the board wants to look at it more closely or bring up or want to like add something, that's fine. But at least at this point, we've put in regulation what was required by the law so that PAs can look and know, okay, here's my, our minimum. Um, because you're right, it just is saying any CME course, and if a, a speaker or something, they don't go through the motions that will allow them to be able to give credit as a course, then that wouldn't count towards this particular requirement. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, you hit the nail on the proverbial head because that's exactly where I was going. I think that needs to be underscored with the licensee that it needs to be a CME approved course as some licensees may think, well, you know, I'm already getting it at my home institution, therefore that meets the requirement. So I think it's uh, uh, imperative that that is underscored so that uh, folks in California know exactly what that requirement is. Excellent, thank um, you. This is Jed. Sonia, can I make a follow-on comment for that? Um, yes, please. Uh, I, Karen, when they talk about this, this is really, if I understand correctly, directed at the CME providers, uh, correct? Like, hey, when you provide CME, you have to use this component. I did recall that our language was really minimal on this. Um, so thanks for refreshing us on that. But um, I think this is more, um, not so much directed at licensees, but CME providers. Is, is my understanding correct? That's correct. It's getting to the licensees by saying to the providers, you can't actually adequate, dis adequately discuss direct patient care unless you address what the re research shows is a part of the air we breathe. <laughs> that, that, you know, you have to know this. So <laughs> yeah, the legislature is aiming at, you, you're going to provide this in here and this is why. Um, but again, what the board wants to do with it, at least we've gotten, you know, staffs work hard and gotten this approved. So now you have this and if you want to build on it or do something different, add to it, whatever, that's, you know, if that's perfectly good idea. But right now, at least you have the requirement yeah. in those courses. Yeah, no, I Thank think that's you. I appreciate the the sort of the refreshing of the memory there. I re we remember our conversations about this. Essentially, if you're going to give CME in California, it's got to include some implicit bias, which is like you said, it's like having air. I mean, we all need to be refreshed on this all the time. Um, but I don't think there is any, if I recall correctly in our conversations, requirements for licensees to actively seek this out. But rather, if you are a CME provider doing some CME in California for PAs, you have to include implicit bias in whatever you're presenting as long as it has something to do with anything to do with patient care. Yes, the legislature said, how can we make sure it's baked in the pie? And if it's just in what you have to get, right. you're going to get it versus you have to go out and look for it. You're going to have less compliance that way. So this is aimed at the providers and it makes sure that it's going to get covered. That's very helpful. Thank right. you. Jennifer. And I think that goes back to, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, Dion, that goes back to your point of, hey, what counts for this and what doesn't. So hopefully anybody who's getting CME within California, is it's gonna, it's required to be as a part of it now. So they don't have to really figure out what counts or what doesn't. If it's CME in California that's approved, then it'll be in there. Thank you so much for the clarification, Jed. I appreciate that. And thank you so much, Karen. Excellent. And yeah, thanks, Karen. Appreciate the help. Yes, thank you again, um, Karen and Jasmine. Uh, for that information. And Karen, I love your analogy. So thank you again um, for that. Um, is there any other uh, member comment or questions?
And if not, um, public comment, Mr. Moderator. We are now open for public comment and we will display uh, instructions on the screen momentarily. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box, which should have appeared in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I believe that we need to take a motion for those actions. Is that correct, Mr. Knutz? Uh, Vice Chair Early, I, I don't think there's any uh, action requested at this point. I think all those were just updates. Is that right, uh, uh, staff? Yes, there were just updates. Okay, great. All right, so no motion is needed. Thank you for those updates and that robust conversation um, with our, our members. I appreciate that. Um, now moving on to item number 14, where we have the Education Workforce Development Advisory Committee. Um, they will be updating us on the physician assistant education programs and applicants in California. And that is by uh, Dr. Grant and Dr. Alexander. All right. Thank you, Sonia. So um, the basically uh, we update this uh, almost every meeting just to, to keep everybody appraised of what's going on with education and workforce. So the total number of PA programs in the United States is 282 with about 35 in development now. Uh, in California, we have 18 PA programs with four in development, which means they have um, expressed uh, or uh, begun the accreditation pathway track with the accrediting body, which is the ARCPA. The geographic distribution is sort of by color there. Most of the programs in California are in the LA and San Diego area. Uh, well, there are four in the Bay Area, two in Sacramento and two on the Central Coast. The numbers that you see for class size uh, were originally obtained from a Physician Assistant Education Association database. Um, and unfortunately with COVID, this database has not been uh, really updated. And so that means we have to go to the individual program websites to determine um, cohort size. And particularly in developing program websites, uh, this number is difficult uh, to find on their websites. Uh, so staff helped me in October, we went through and found some of these, but where we can't uh, find the number either because their website isn't clear, just weren't able to confirm uh, what the number is, we have used a national average of uh, 46. And so if we look at that, our current annual capacity from programs within California, assuming that every seat is filled and that every student that matriculates graduates, um, you have about 856 um, graduating. And then when the programs uh, that are currently developing uh, hit their full expansion, we should have around 1,035, 34 or so, uh, somewhere in there, uh, around 1,000 graduates a year within California. And since we're licensing roughly 1,200 a year, it looks like new grads, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, um, we're getting a growth from outside the state as well, which we expect. So Lots of robust growth. We've saw this um, when I came on the board back in 2013, I think there were six PA programs in California or maybe eight. Uh, so um, there, there uh, has been tremendous growth of PA education within California, um, which is good. This means we're gonna end up, mo most people, the majority of PA students um, continue to practice within the state where they train. And many PA programs uh, recruit uh, primarily from the areas where they're located, although there is some crossover. Some people come from other states and go back to those. Some people come from California and go to other states. Um, generally speaking, they tend to either go back to where they came from or stay where the school is. Uh, so this helps us sort of know where, um, you know, people are going to practice and what's going to be happening 
uh, with workforce growth within California uh, in terms of PAs in the next few years. So most schools, uh, I, I currently work at a school, uh, the application pool is robust. Uh, we have uh, several hundred applicants for each available seat. Uh, and these are really well qualified applicants. So I uh, would expect that this growth will continue for the next several years. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates a roughly 30% growth in the PA profession nationwide in the next uh, 10 years. So um, there's going to continue to be growth, and that's uh, something we can expect to see in California continue as well with the growth of these programs. And I think uh, shows a lot of uh, good foresight on the part of the EO and making sure the board is fully staffed because as as we have more licensees there will just be uh, more and more work for the staff um, in terms of um, ensuring public protection licensing and all of those uh, sorts of things so uh, that's the basics uh, on that i'm happy to answer any questions or dr alexander can uh, if any board members or public have questions Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Um, that was excellent to hear. And you are correct. Uh, California started off with about seven programs um, a little over a decade ago, and we have tripled um, our school capacity since that, or more than tripled our school capacity since that time. And we continue to grow to meet the healthcare demands um, of our state and then also the United States. And so um, I would anticipate that the PA profession would continue to proliferate over the next years. And again, um, it's just to, we were created to help the, the, the shortage in uh, medical care. And so we continue to do that. So um, thank you for your report. Um, it, it provides great um, information for us to know uh, about and then also to continue to see where we grow um, in the future. Um, any other um, PA member comment or questions for Dr. Grant? Dr. Grant, uh, this is Dion, great report. Um, as we start to see a proliferation of these programs, um, have you noticed, I know you're, you're, you're in a program yourself, have you noticed issues with clinical site acquisition related to program growth? Uh, yeah, thank you for asking that question. Uh, a great question. And um, I think with your background in education, you're, you uh, probably know that this, the biggest uh, limiting factor for program growth is uh, clinical sites. Um, the PA training model just for the um, unlicensed members of the board and public, uh, the first uh, half, maybe a little over half of the PA uh, program training includes uh, all mostly didactic instruction in a classroom. But the second half, analogous to medical school, includes clinical rotations um, at various uh, rotation sites. There's uh, nine rotations that are required by the accrediting body and then a number of electives. And those rotations are done in hospitals and clinics and at various places um, all around the state and country. And most of those providers who are serving as clinical preceptors, um, while they, many of them have clinical faculty appointments, um, most of the programs in California are not associated with medical schools, which means that most of those clinical preceptors are um, practicing PAs and physicians um, out in the community that are training PAs so that they'll come out, you know, return to the community and practice to help meet uh, workforce needs. So when you're talking about uh, being in the midst of a pandemic and already having a very heavy workload, sometimes training students on top of that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and so it is a limiting factor for growth in PA programs, particularly in PA programs that have large numbers of students. For example, if you have the, the, the national average is 45, and in California, it's 46 students. But if you have a program that has more than that, then you have to have, uh, you know, at least nine clinical sites for each, you know, nine clinical rotations for each student. Um, that gets to be quite a large number of clinical rotations. So um, the accrediting body does a great job of making sure that the rotations are adequate and properly staffed by um, you know, uh, appropriately licensed preceptors that are qualified to train, but um, they they are doing this as a way to um, help uh, the workforce need. And when when pandemic hit and uh, workload becomes severe, many people uh, just don't have the capacity to do that. So that that's the biggest limiting factor 
as Dr. Kidd mentioned, that uh, we just uh, don't have enough clinical sites. And thank you for that. I would have to include that, um, you know, just as mentioned with the pandemic, um, those sites, a lot of the sites have gone um, down during that time just to man the effort. And so uh, we continue to um, request that they come back online. But again, it's a it's a pandemic. And uh, even though COVID waxes and wanes, it does hamper the ability to have uh, substantial clinical sites for the PA students. So I would agree. Any other PA um, member comment or questions? Thank you so much, uh, Drs. Grant and Alexander, for that information. Um, if we have no further questions for the uh, members, um, can we move to public comment, Mr. Moderator? We are now open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A section located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comments. Seeing no request for public comments, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you so much. And, and again, thank you for that report. Um, now I'd like to move to item number 15, uh, the report by the Legislative Committee uh, discussing the poss and possible action to consider uh, positions regarding the following uh, legislation. Uh, Ms. Dillon. All right, so we'll start with AB 646. Um, this is a two-year bill and is actually located in the Senate right now on its first reading. Um, this bill was amended in assembly on January 24th, 2022. Um, the amendment um, provision states that this bill would require the board to charge a fee of $25 to the person to cover the reasonable regulatory cost of administering the bill's provisions unless there is no associated cost with implementing this bill. And um, just as a summary, um, this bill would require programs um, who post information on their website about a revoked license due to a criminal conviction to post notification of an expungement within 90 days of the board receiving an expungement order related to the conviction for those who reapply for licensure or are re-licensed. And at its August 9th, 2021 meeting, the board chose to maintain its watch position on this bill. Uh, the board may see some minor increases in revenue if this bill passes as individuals seek expungement and apply for the removal of disciplinary documents or posting of the expungement. The web posting and removal of documents would fall under the board's regular pro rata towards DCA, Office of Information Services, and would be minor and absorbable. However, these costs may be offset by the $25 fee charged to the person whose license was revoked. And moving on to SB 731, this bill is located in the Assembly Committee on Appropriations. On September 10th, 2021, this bill was refused passage, but the motion to reconsider was continued as of January 25th, 2022. And, uh, this, and staff will continue to monitor this bill for any updates that may be coming. But as of the last board meeting, there has there have not been any new updates uh, to SB 731. And moving on to AB 562, this bill is located in the Senate Committee on Appropriations. Um, at its August 9, 2021 meeting, the board chose to maintain its watch position. And there have, been, have not been any substantive updates or amendments to this bill as of the last board meeting. And then AB 3... 1306. Uh, this bill is located in the Senate Committee on Appropriations. And at its August 9th, 2021 meeting, the board took a support position. And there have been no updates as of the last board meeting to this bill as well, but we continue to monitor it. 
And that concludes the report. Are there any questions from any members? Um, with item or AB 646, um, we currently had a watch position with that new information of the $25 fee change. I think that was the only thing that was added. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that will change our position um, with that little bit of information, but that was my only question. So this is Jed. I was just curious. It looks to me, I, I haven't read the bill, so please excuse my ignorance, but it looks like the $25 fee goes only to the person seeking the expungement and change. Is that correct? It's not a fee to all licensees? Correct. It'll only apply to the licensee who is applying or who is requesting to have the expungement order um, posted or removed. Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. Is there any other PA comment or question? Other member comment or questions? Okay, hearing none, um, we can move to public comment. Um, Mr. Moderator. We are once again open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box located in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Now let us take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, thank you, please. And with no changes uh, to our uh, previous um, position, uh, we will continue on. Thank you for Ms. Thank you, Ms. Dillon, for and uh, for, for for providing that report um, and provided that information to us. That was great. Um, I'd like to move to item number 16 um, to address the agenda items for next meeting. Um, Ms. Khan, besides all the, you know, the regular um, uh, information, I don't remember any additions. Do you have any additions um, that might go on for the next meeting agenda? Uh, the agenda item 11, just bringing in uh, additional uh, information regarding uh, the you know, a PDF copy of the pocket license. Awesome. Very good. And Ms. Caldwell mentioned that she would uh, take care of that. Any other, um, does anybody else have any other meeting agenda items? Um, any PA board members, comments, questions, additions? Uh, this is Jed. If it's okay, um, I don't know if we would fall under the uh, disciplinary report or not, but I would like to uh, hear about um, the reviewer process and where we are on PA reviewer of initial complaints. Uh, if it's covered under the disciplinary report, that's fine. I just want to make sure we have it on the agenda. Excellent. Any other member comments or questions or additions to that agenda? Hearing none, we'd like to take in public comment, Mr. Moderator. We have once again reopened for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box located in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand. Let's take just a moment to see if we have a request for public comment.
Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comments at this time? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure, Mr. Knotes, do I need a vote for that agenda or is that something that we can um, simply address on the next meeting? Uh, uh, Vice President Early, I, I don't see any matters that that require a motion at this at this point in terms of in, in terms of uh, placing items on the agenda for the next meeting. Excellent. I didn't either, but I just wanted to double check. So thank you so much. Well, I want to thank everyone. We're getting ready to move into closed session. So I want to thank everyone for attending and then also helping me. Um, everyone helped me with putting on this meeting in our absence of our PA board president, uh, Juan Armenta, who will be back on our next meeting. Um, and so when we move into closed session, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that due to technical limitations, our adjournment will not be broadcast. Adjournment will, um, will immediately follow the closed session and there will be no other items of business discussed. Uh, again, thank you all for a robust conversation and making sure that we address everything that was on our agenda. And I look forward to seeing everyone um, at our next meeting. And we'll move into closed session. <laughs>